Dear friends, um, as director at the Finnish Institute, I'm very pleased to wish you all very welcome to this seminar arranged by the Nordic Council of Ministers, the National Council of Swedish Youth Organizations, the independent think tank Global Utmaning, and the Finnish Institute in Stockholm. And welcome also to our house, originally built in the end of the 19th century for another youth organization, the Stockholm branch of YMCA, Young Men's Christians Association. Now we are happy to have a very mixed public and also an international one. Mainly we are discussing uh, bilateral issues between Sweden and Finland, but today we are happy to broaden the perspective and discuss how the Nordic countries and also maybe the Baltic states together can work to fulfill the important 17 goals set up by the United Nations. And I'm really impressed that so many people are ready to spend a Friday afternoon with us to discuss these matters, but I see this as uh, we are discussing really important questions, but also a sign that many people are or by themselves also ready to work to fulfill these goals. We have a lot of interesting speakers here, so let's start, and I will, I'm pleased to give the floor to Johan Hassel from Global Utmaning, who will be moderating the seminar and lead us through the discussions this afternoon. Once again, warmly welcome and I wish you an interesting afternoon. Very much welcome. Thank you very much, Anders. We are truly enjoying the collaboration that we have here with the Finnish Institute in Stockholm, the Nordic Council of Ministers, and the Swedish Youth League, all of you speakers, and all of you with inside of this room. Because today, we from the Think Tank Global Utmaning, which is an independent think tank for sustainable development, and my name is Johan Hassel, we're going to try to empower the next generation. So we're hoping that we will provide you with the knowledge and the tools in order to make sure that we're fulfilling the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals set out by the United Nations, through enabling and letting by the force of the younger generation. So that is the task of today. And we will try to talk about the SDGs, increased knowledge, not least about consumption and sustainable consumption, about leadership in general, about leadership and multi-sectoral and actors' relevance and legitimization in the implementation process, and why youth is key are we trying to answer foremost. This agenda sets out a picture, a vision and a narrative for how we're going to make a world without poverty, how we are going to make the world gender equal, how we're going to empower young girls, young women, how we're going to manage sustainable consumption and create inclusive societies for all, and how we're going to turn climate change into an opportunity and not only a threat. And what we're going to focus on the later part of the seminar is sustainable consumption. And usually I joke about this agenda because it's an agenda which is for developing countries and developed countries. And usually we think that we're only going to help the developing countries. But if you're looking at Sweden, if you're looking at the Nordic countries, and we can really see that we're a laggard when it comes to consumption. We are consuming 4.2 planets. So in that perspective and in other many other perspectives, we are actually the developing country. The developing country which needs to learn and which needs to change. And we're going to make sure that we see that as an opportunity and not as a threat of our nice and fancy lifestyles that we're enjoying together. So we have a full seminar, uh, one and a half hour. We're going to try to be interactive. You're all invited afterwards for a talk with the partners and together with the speakers. Uh, so we're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. And we are also live streaming, which means that all of you who are also taking part from the web are mostly welcome. And those of you who want to scream out that you're joining this seminar and this discussion are free to use the hashtags uh, Agenda 2030, GUSM, and add all of us. And uh, Youth Empowerment is the general team that we are putting forward today. 
So once again, uh, very much welcome, and it's my honor and privilege to actually start off and let this seminar kick off uh, with the chair, the president of the Swedish National Council on Swedish Youth, Rosaline Marbina. Uh, you're very much welcome to give us the welcome keynote and tell us why and how we're going to work this through. Welcome and give her a big applaud. Hello everyone, um, welcome everyone to this seminar about Agenda 2030, the Nordic way, time to empower the next generation. And I will start with a quote by former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who said, we are the first generation that can end poverty and the last that can end climate change. We will not only, we will, we will also do this and this seminar is about how can we, in a Nordic collaboration, actually combat the challenges we have and implement the uh, sustainable development goals together. And I also hope that this seminar will be the beginning uh, of a larger, larger discussion uh, and, and uh, that we can be brave to collaborate uh, between countries, between organizations, cross-sectorial, uh, on all levels of society uh, to, to do this. But how can we actually implement the agenda? How can we empower young people and how can we collaborate on a, on a Nordic level? And I will start with the, the first aspect, uh, which I believe is uh, the res democratic responsibility that we have. This agenda is something that uh, the government, uh, it's actually an agenda of dreams, in my opinion. Uh, it, uh, 193 countries together uh, met and, and dreamed about the future of the world, and, and this is the result we can see ahead of us. Um, but we also have to, to uh, take the responsibility and implement it locally. And as, as Yuan said before, we, I believe all states are in a developing uh, phase, in my opinion. We in Sweden have to look, for, uh, look inwards and see how we can strengthen uh, our, our conditions in order to, to implement this. And why, one way to do this, and this, this is something that they all, all of the Nordic countries have in common, and that we have to include young people people in this. We have to understand that young people and the youth movements within those countries are the leading, uh, the leading actors uh, of this agenda and of sustainability in general because this is something that we are affected by but we will also be affected by at uh, 2030 when I know that I will not be young anymore. And that is the, the uh, we are sustainability in itself in a way. So include young people. And on a Nordic level, we have to, as, once again, look inwards, like how can the, the government, how can the political parties uh, integrate Agenda 2030 and, and invite young people in the implementation and follow monitoring of Agenda 2030. It's crucial, uh, because then it's, it's one of our biggest questions. Um, and if we, if we, I believe that if we include young people, we will also be able to implement all of this and, and move one step ahead. And also end poverty and, and uh, climate change, as Ban Ki-moon said before. But in addition, I want to say like the importance of having an order collaboration. We have the conditions to implement the agenda. I believe. And we have to be brave and we have to be ambitious in this. We have to be ambitious in the implementation uh, together in the Nordic and together we have to impact the European Union to implement it and, and to move forward and be the, the leading institution uh, con uh, towards the United Nations. For instance in climate when we, we can't find any other world leader doing that. So we have to be the one and I believe we will be the one internally in the European Union that, uh, that says that as well. So, on all levels of society, cross-sectorial, but um, and, and everywhere, young people should be involved in this implementation uh, of the Agenda 2030, and uh, uh, I hope that this seminar, once again, will be the beginning of a greater discussion and, and the start of the collaboration between governments, but also uh, NGOs and other actors in, in, once again, ending poverty and ending climate change. Thank you. Rosalina, you talked about the importance of dreaming, togetherness, and, and action. And 
uh, usually when decision makers try to involve young people, they are saying that they're doing it for them, and it's, you know, dreaming for a prosperous future in front of them. And, and this time, a lot of things is different, because it's very urgent, and you stress climate change, and we talked about consumption and so on. So, so, so what is the key for making youth the drivers of change, and not only working for youth, but with youth? Mm -hmm. And like for, for, for me, it's simple. It's, uh, it's including young people and actually it's not simple. <laughs> it's to like, how can we end, it's a bigger question. How can we end marginalization of young people? This is how I interpret that. How can young people not be token? How can we actually be uh, part of decision making and be seen as uh, individuals uh, that will have access to all rights? Because it's not, uh, this is not the state we are in right now. Uh, how we can end it is to actually be invited into the decision making rooms and this is like in my speech I addressed it many times like include young people, include organizations because if we do that for sure we will, uh, we will have a new narrative on, on the sustainable world we want to create uh, and more like how we can do it uh, I believe to like more, more specifically is to be part of the implementation on how we will implement, implement it. We have to create indicators um, because to be honest if we read the targets of the sustainable development goals um, Sweden, at least Sweden and I believe all the Nordic countries can, can like check everything because uh, how can I say, um, we, we, have, we are quite developed, we have still, be, we need, still need to be more developed though. Um, but we have to create indicators that move forward the ambition because once again we have all the conditions to implement it and we have to be brave, we have to be ambitious and therefore we have to uh, create indicators that Im imply that. And also on the monitoring, and that's crucial to create young, like to, to make young people, um, like to create young people as an institution of accountability. And if we monitor the Agenda 2030 and the work of the Nordic collaboration and this and the governments there, I believe we will actually have a say. Thank you. And we will actually use you in exactly that capacity. <laughs> to, uh, because uh, Rosaline, together with Simon, will come back in the end of the seminar when we listen to all of the conversations and presentations. And we will evaluate and we will discuss and we will comment and see if the decision makers that we have invited is actually fulfilling um, what they're saying. So, thank you very much, Rosaline, and soon welcome back. Our, our second keynote is Katrin Sjögren, Head of Government and Government of Åland. And Åland is one of the real frontrunners, a local community in a global context which has set out this agenda and a very key path for sustainability. So very much welcome and the floor is yours. Dear ladies and gentlemen, First, thank you for the opportunity to describe the road and the roadmap for the Åland Islands to become sustainable last by 2051. I'm both really honored and glad. I think it's about 12 or maybe 13 years ago since Mr. Rajendra Pachuri, the former leader of the UN's first panel on climate change said that the society that have about 30,000 inhabitants have the best possibilities to do the necessary green conversion in the fast lane. Åland is a society in forward momentum and actually we are just under 30,000 inhabitants. Throughout the centuries, the people who have lived in the Åland archipelago have taken care of their fellow humans and the natural environment. They are too both distressed and forced. We live in the middle of the Baltic and are, frankly, out on our own. If we have a problem, we have to solve it. The people of the Åland Islands live and breathe the Baltic Sea. If the Baltic becomes so polluted that you can't swim, fish, nor sail, we will actually become environmental refugees. 
The ambition has always been to hand over the baton to the next generation in as good condition as it was when it was received. Those efforts have in many ways created a fantastic welfare society. We direct thoughts of gratitude to the earlier generations with the understanding that the nature constitutes the foundation of human existence. The member of our parliament, the Åland Lagting, chose in 2014 to adopt a collective goal of total sustainable development in Åland no later than 2051. The collective pursuit on this goal requires a development and sustainable agenda for Åland. This one. The agenda consists of vision, a strategic development goals, examples of possible indicators for monitoring these goals, and supporting structures for the realization of the agenda. And do we, do we have backlashes? Do we make progress? It's very important to measure. So once a year, we are taking, uh, we are uh, leaving a status report. That you, you could see the indicators and the status, how we are doing on the Holland Islands. In parallel with the definition of an agenda for Holland, the rest of the world has done the same. UN member states formally adopted the Agenda 2030 with 17 sustainable de development goals for the world. The, reali the, the realization of the local agenda is at the same time the Åland contribution, albeit small, but still, to the implementation of the worldwide Agenda 2030. The vision is a picture of the best all and we can imagine. It's a picture that inspires and motivates and which gives the strength and desire to make sustainable decisions, great and small, even if it be, might be easier to do as before. The vision is everyone can flourish in a viable society on the islands of peace. To flourish is about something deeper than material well-being and that everything should always be fun. Åland society has conditions that allow people to thrive and to be happy, to know that we are, are seen and accept, accepted. Viability is about providing for your needs without future generations, poorly treated sheep labor, or other living things in the form of animals and nature having to pay the price. The seven strategic development goals have their fundament in the four sustainable principles. The goals are one, happy people whose inherent resources increase. Two, everyone feels trust and has real possibilities to participate in society. Three, all water is of good quality. Four, ecosystems in balance and biological diversity. Five, attra attractive for residents, visitors and business. Six, significantly higher proportion of energy from renewable sources, plus increased energy efficiency. Seven, sustainable and mindful patterns of consumption and production. The hardest goal, I think. I, I agree with you there, Johan. Our network includes all kinds of participants. Let's, let's give some examples how we work. Our 15 biggest companies are in a strategic way working with goal 1, 2 and 7 to brain gain Åland. The Åland Chamber of Commerce have courses in sustainability closing. Right now we are hiring a leading sustainable pilot who will support and help smaller enterprises, NGOs and authorities. We are offering introduction courses in sustainability in our University of Applied Science and we actually have a, a 
communication goal by 2020. In 2020, 80% of the Orlanders over 13 years shall have knowledge of the vision and 50% of the Orlanders over 13 years old shall have been taken action and steps to fulfill the vision. Teachers, principal, school leaders, that uh, they wished for a lighter version of the agenda. It was not so easy to read and understand and to get a grip on. And for a couple of days we got this let last, and it's rather fantastic. If you want to have a summary what sustainability is, you could read this in half an hour, maybe 15 minutes. It was a demand from, from the teacher and the principals. We want to take this to, to school and learn the children. So I have some examples. You could take them if you want to. This August Regeneration 2030 Summit take place in the, for the first time in Norland. Young people from the Nordic and the Baltic regions shall discuss and propose solutions so we can reach and fulfill the Agenda 2030. I'm looking very much forward to that. At last, in Åland we have found a method and a way to work strategic with sustainable issues. I personally think that it is the complete way to think and act when you make political decisions. Yes, we have an agenda, we have indicators, we have methods, goals and a strategic way on our road to a sustainable and viable society. But, but we are by all means far from our goals still. We are just in the beginning and we can't do it alone. The rest of the world must follow. Thank you. Uh, thank you for really laying out a very good presentation of how you can transform these 17 goals and 119 goals to what is relevant for your and creating thematical processes which you described that you're working with. Um, as you said, a community of about 30,000 or a bit less than is having the perfect conditions. And this is an agenda which all of the world should reach by 2030. And I try to convince the Swedish government of saying that since the rest of the world should reach this agenda by 2030, and we're kind of you know, well positioned of doing that, perhaps we should read it, you know, we should reach it a bit earlier on. So from that perspective, when should really Åland reach the 2030 agenda? By 2025 or by 2020 or what would be your ambition? Uh, I think we have actually the ambition in 2030. With some goals it's going to get very much faster, but some are, are rather hard. To, to fulfill and the Åland Island we are we are in the middle of the nowhere we are depend on cars and ferries in the archipelago but I think I'm hopeful and I think it's very important to be hopeful and to, to show the progress that we are making because otherwise we can't uh, we can't have people to, to make the change and we have to do it together you are the government this is a sustainability agenda and it demands and requires democracy. And democracy is kind of scrutinized partly because it's not seen as taking you know, bold decisions enough for acting so on. So what is, what is the linkage between sustainability and democracy and how, how can this sustainability agenda help us strengthen democracy and how is it dependent from each other? I think right now we, the democracy are under pressure as, as well as it is in the Nordic re region as well. And I think uh, uh, democracy doesn't belong to the politicians. And I, oh, I often find out that if you ask uh, the people, if you ask the young people, they often have solutions. Because uh, politicians and the older generation, we are stuck in, in old patterns and, and things that we we have to uh, find, find a solution. Young people doesn't even see the problem. So I think that find a way to talk to people and, and to empower people. And 
I think that's the answer, and that's that's how we have to see on, on democracy. Because you, people are leaving the, the the traditional political parties and th find other ways to 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 do the world a better place to live in. Thank you very much, Katrin. <laughs> we are. We're now acting upon your words, uh, because we are then inviting a panelist of actors, which is holding multilateral capacity, and is the ones that are going to transform this change, and which is then representing both civil society and different institutions, and which is going to help us talk about how do we implement and realize this agenda. So very much welcome, Krista Campus. You are head of the Sustainable, Sustainable Development Unit of the Center for Baltic Sea Strategy. So please take a role here. Johan Tideman, you're head of the office of the Nordic Council. Katte Sista, you're president of the Nordic Youth Council. Hanna Bergman, you are the youth representative to the United Nations from Sweden. Vladas Polivsius, I hope I said it decently right, which are an elected board member of the Lithuanian Youth Council, and Nora Beruba, which are the governing member of the European Youth Parliament. Which means that we actually managed to put on stage representatives from Sweden with the UN mission, from Lithuania, working with the Youth Council and implementing the Youth Voice, uh, together with representatives looking at the European Parliament, key actors from the Nordic office and also from the Baltic region which you're acting upon and then the Nordic Youth Council. So we have all of these aspects and, and that I think is the perfect setting. If you're not going to solve this for us, it won't be solved. Uh, so don't feel any pressures regarding this. But we want to focus this discussion on, and I'm going to first turn to you, Krista. That is, how do we do this regionally? What is the role of integrating this agenda, which is a new agenda, but which is also consisting a lot of different agendas that we already had? So how are we integrating, how are we strengthening, making it alive in the institutions and in the strategies of the networks that we have? How are we going to realize these visions, these dreams into action? Krista. Yes, uh, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, of course, thank you um, for introducing me as, as someone who is representing all the EU strategy for the Baltic region. But actually, I am coordinating horizontal action climate in the frame of the EU strategy for the Baltic region. But uh, every day I'm working at the Council of the Baltic Sea States and I'm head uh, of Baltic 2030 unit. So I am also coordinating sustainability related issues uh, in, uh, in um, the Baltic region we have 11 uh, member countries. But uh, coming back to your question, I think one uh, very important uh, thing uh, when it comes to realizing sustainable development goals in the Baltic region is uh, collaboration. But in order to make the countries collaborate, you have to make them to understand where the problems and, and gaps are. And I'm very happy that Nordic Council of Ministers came up with uh, the bumps on the road to uh, 2030. And I just uh, would like to inform you that, that we are, are doing uh, more or less the same. We are following the same criteria and, and the same uh, uh, indicators as uh, NCM did, uh, which is Petersman Stiftung and uh, Sustainable Sev Development Solutions Network. And um, uh, this report is not finalized yet. It is bumps on the road to Baltic 2030. It will be ready uh, by May, uh, hopefully, and it will be published and, and introduced uh, at the EU strategy uh, of the Baltic Sea. Uh, stra sorry. EU strategy for the Baltic Sea Region Annual Forum in Tallinn, uh, 4th and 5th of, of May. Uh, and uh, this report is complementing uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers report on pumps on the road, and it provides the general, let's say, picture where we are as the countries when it comes to implementing sustainable development goals. And although the, all the Nordic countries are in the top 10 in the world rankings, uh, and Germany as well, but when you look more in detail where we are as the region, then actually the situation is not very rosy. I can just, unfortunately, I, I do not have any slides, but you can see from here the how many rates critical sustainable development goals we have. And the only goal that all countries are more or less doing, doing well is goal one. 
no poverty. But when it comes to all other goals, all countries actually are lacking behind. And there are two groups of, of, let's say, goals. So one group is which, um, one group of goals is where all, which is critical for all the countries, all countries. And other group of the goals are um, where there are biggest, let's say, disparities between the countries. And in that sense, I have to say that that is evidence why actually countries have to collaborate, because we need strong partnership, we need uh, um, a transfer and exchange of best practices, best policies, and best tools for, and means for implementation. And I also think that, that um, just my, let's say, request to you is don't forget the countries in the eastern shore of the Baltic Sea who are lacking behind. And I think Nordic countries have so many good examples uh, which can and should be transferred uh, and be learned uh, um, to these countries uh, who are not uh, there yet. So, uh, um, and of course, this seminar is about youth involvement and I think young people are the key. Um, with th this is your future, this is your future, not ours. And my first recommendation is, go and vote. You know what happened with Brexit. Young people were very passive and then this happened. So this is your responsibility as well. So be more active when it comes to participation in, in, in the local elections or elections to, to, to national parliaments. But for me, the key word is strong leadership, strong multi-level and multi-stakeholder partnership, which covers all the Baltic Sea region. This is very important because otherwise our region as a whole will not be, we will not realize uh, sustainable development goals as a region by 2030. Only a group of the countries might be there, but not all of us. And I think that is very important thing we should not forget. Krista, you, you focused on the bumps and, and, and that we have some strength and we also have some weaknesses. And this is a global agenda which everybody has signed on and you en encourage us to vote in the national elections. Uh, to hold our politicians accountable and, and drive it forward. And then you're representing the, the regional perspective regarding this. Mm -hmm. so, so, so what is the role of regional cooperation between the nation and the global international agenda in, 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 in working with sustainability here? I think there are two aspects. Uh, one is, uh, as I said, that, that we need strong collaboration in order to achieve it. And if we achieve sustainable development goals as a region, we achieve it also in the global level. So we, are, we contribute to, uh, to achieving SDGs uh, globally as well. And the other thing is that, that, that we can show the Baltic Sea region as a, as a good example on partnership, good example for other countries, how you can, in a collaborative way, uh, implement and realize sustainable development goals as a group of the countries and I think that is that is something that could be more introduced also maybe at the UN level at the global level so that other regions can can follow this practice that we have in the Baltic Sea region as well there was one thing I also just forgot I wanted to, to introduce you that I am very happy in that sense that that uh, we have political com commitment uh, and uh, commitment from all 11 governments uh, of um, the Council of the Baltic Sea States countries, which involves all Nordic countries and then Baltic countries, Poland, Germany and Russia. And in June uh, last uh, summer, the foreign ministers of 11 uh, countries of the Baltic Sea region, they endorsed the document called uh, Baltic 2030 Action Plan. I have some leaflets back there, so you can, you can take them. And um, that document is providing the vision that governments agreed. What kind of future uh, and vision we would like uh, for this region by 2030 and that also um, identifies six uh, um, strategic actions and then six uh, focus areas. And, and I think um, this maybe action plan is a little bit like too confusing name but you know that is compromise uh, you know <laughs> between 11 countries but that provides the vision and that is provides the framework for collaboration and engagement of all the different stakeholders from the region and I already see that, that, that this, this positive activation process is in motion already. So we need also uh, the, the agreements, political agreements between 
within the governments because that helps uh, to, to really facilitate also uh, collaboration when we have positive signals from the countries. Thank you. You won. Uh you're head of the Office of the Nordic Council, which means that you are representing one of the world's oldest institutions of collaboration. How is this helping and strengthening our work for sustainability? Well, that was a really big question, but uh, maybe, I come back to that. Point. maybe I come back to that. Um, well, I will come back to that, because I wanted to start saying something else. Um, the UN General Assembly's uh, resolution on the 2030 Sustainable Development Goal include ecology and livelihood alongside the same socio-economic dimensions as the Millennium Developing Development Goals. This plan applies to every country worldwide, a universal plan for humanity in its entity. The adoption of Agenda 2030 is based on the division of social and economic transformation. The world's seven and a half billion inhabitants stand together for a higher degree of justice broad and improved access and essential and critical material goods, while also preventing the destruction of livelihood itself, planet Earth. Fortunately, the Nordic region has a very strong position with respect to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. The Nordic region has both ideas and practical solutions that other parts of the world may benefit from, and are actually. It is important that we have creative awareness of this in the Nordic countries. The goals must influence aid and foreign policy in the Nordic region over the next 12 years. This goal must also influence the social and economic policies within the region itself. <clears throat> to a large extent, the new sustainable development goals are the result of what the Nordic countries have mentioned to the UN over the last few decades, and of the Nordic countries' development and foreign policy. This includes both the Brundtland Report in 1987 and the first global conference on the environment in 1972 in Stockholm. In this respect, it could be said that the Nordic region has a particular responsibility for ensuring that goals are met both within the Nordic region and worldwide. The Nordic Council is a tool with the objective to both impact the politi political agenda in the Nordic region and to launch action where cooperation is a bonus. In the past years, the Nordic Council has developed several suggestions on how it can, be, how it can contribute to achieve the ambitions in the UN's 2030 goals. Let me mention some of these suggestions. The Council of Ministers <coughs> sustainable indicators to show if the Nordic countries are on the way to reach the 2030 goal. The Council of Ministers can share knowledge and experience about best practices. And finally, the Council of Ministers and the Nordic Council facilitate, can facilitate forums for politi politicians and scientists where they can meet and share experiences. We would also like to see that the Nordic Council of Ministers initiate activities promoting awareness of the sustainable, sustainability goals and understanding of the importance of the goals among the general public in the Nordic region, especially among young people. This can be done through initiatives in collaborations with the Nordic non-governmental organizations such as Nordic uh, UN associations and Northern Association, with also with uh, uh, Nordic Youth, with the Nordic Youth Council, uh, that was given uh, actually a 20% rise in its uh, in support from from the Nordic Council this year, and one of them we we hope that some of those, those money will go to to, the, to to work. To sum it up, together we are strong and we can who can make a difference. And I only want to, to agree and stress that for the young people, go out and vote. Take your responsibility. That's, that's what can help. Thank you. Thank you. I think you actually answered the question. Uh, because yes. you talked about Nordics being in the front run when it comes to taking a global position and trying to strengthen the agenda, which demands that you together sort of see where you're going. And, and also looking at collaboration, the role of civil society, and how do you create policy coherence, and so on. But if, if, you would, if we're trying to push it down a bit, what is the main challenge for the Nordics today? 
when it comes to reaching these goals and, and what could be, if we're single outing something, what could be the main difference the Nordics could do on the implementation of this global agenda when it comes to giving an example or stressing one agenda? <laughs> That's a really difficult question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very broad question. Um, we have, um, we have uh, I think we have a very good chance to be, be the first region in the world to reach the goals. Maybe not 100%, but let's say 90, 95%. Uh, and the politicians, the governments, we have a representative of the Swedish government here, and I, I hope you agree that... that uh, we'll that, see later. Yeah. <laughs> When, when, this, when the government are, meet, are, are meeting, they agree fundamentally. There are, there are smaller differences because of in, industry history or other kind of history or culture, but in general, um, we have the same uh, view that we have to reach the goal. And we can see now that the rest of the world are looking at us. They're looking at us saying, how do you do it? You have um, uh, high uh, environmental uh, regulations, you have high taxes, have very uh, low unemployment. How does it all work? Yeah. And uh, people are looking at us. So we have to, I think, that the governments and the, pol and the parliamentarians have to take this responsibility and um, fulfill what they have promised. I, I think that's a key insight, that, that in, in this achieving of these goals, the world is actually looking at the Nordic countries and, and we have a difficulty answering the question. And perhaps uh, one of the most important tasks that we have in front of us is, is to answer that question. How can we actually make a difference and what are we strengthening for? Underneath everything that you have talked about is actually about trust in society. Trust between people and trust towards institutions. And, and the think tank I've explored is, and that's why we're labeling this the Nordic way of saying that what is actually key for transformation and meeting global challenges, that is the trust within inside of society. And the, re the reason why we're stressing the role of young people is because all of society needs to be re revitalized and, and get influenced in order to be able to meet those challenges. And that's why I'm turning to you, Katie, because this is one of the oldest institutions, the Nordic Councils and the Nordic Corporation. So how do we ensure uh, that it stays young? <laughs> um, first of all, it's quite unique in the world that youth are actually sitting in the same tables as the politicians who've been elected through elections. And that's something that is something that we should really appreciate. That is something that Rosalyn brought up in her keynotes. Uh, what I liked about your keynote was the idea of this agenda being description of a dream that we have for the world 2030. And uh, what I see is that youth perspectives bring, we bring the ideas, we bring the perspectives in order how to reach these goals. Um, what I see, what both you guys brought up was the importance of voting. And that's the traditional way of making the difference. But the way I see it is that we, if we discuss the current solutions, if we discuss youth involvement, then we should also discuss different ways of participating, making a difference. Because so many people have said that youth are game changers, but maybe the most natural way of making a difference for us isn't only by voting, but also through our choices in life. Where do we want to live? How do we work? Uh, how do we want to participate? Because, for example, the amount of members in the political parties in Nordics is diminishing, and still, what I want, at least want to believe is that youth want to make a difference and these goals are also something that youth are interested in. But what I see is also that um, politicians are very, very much aware of this. And in this room we all for sure know what these goals are. But if we would go out to the street, pick a random youth there and ask it, okay, what are, do you know the agenda of 2030 goals? I'm not quite sure that they would know. They would know the answer to the question. They might have heard about it, but they wouldn't be able to say what are the goals. Um, and that's something that we also in the UNRG, we try to tell people about these goals and also maybe make a different, find new ways 
of making difference because we are a group of youth from all political backgrounds, from all the Nordics. So that's quite a gang. Uh, there's um, all the different ideas, ways of thinking, and we seriously sit in our sessions so long that we find a common solution, that we see we are on the same page and that everyone can stand behind our decisions. And then we take these ideas to the Nordic Council. And we are very much appreciative that you've taken into account our ideas, for example, the Nordic e-identification that, uh, that was accepted, the resolution was accepted in the Nordic Council session in Helsinki uh, last fall. Um, what I see is that these ideas helping youth, making it possible for youth to move across the countries, countries' borders, to meet new people, is the way of making a difference also in the society, indirectly. We meet new people, understand better new ways of thinking, different ways of thinking, and that is something that is, for example, contributing to the goal of peace. Um, the way I see it also is that youth are changing the way of consumption in the Nordics. For example, the shirt I'm wearing, I don't own this. I borrowed it from this shop in my hometown of Turku, where you can buy a membership and you can borrow clothes for two, one week, two weeks, but all, what I just want to point out with this example is that we youth are also changing the whole concept of ownership. And that is something that politicians should be very much aware of, because the change is already happening in society, and the way I see it is that the Nordic way is through the society, civil society. And what politicians really, we as politicians or politically active people should be doing right now is making it possible for this change to happen. Thank you. I think you pointed out uh, the key of sitting around the table. Hanna, you are now going for the United Nations to sit around the table. So what is your message? Uh, I went last year, so I already had my chance actually. Uh, but I did have a chance to talk a lot with young people before going uh, and actually discussing these matters. And I am pretty sure that while Many people, many young people might not know the agenda itself. They are already working for the causes. They are working for all these issues without even knowing it. Uh, and the issues are rather how they are going to fund it and have the resources and time to actually do it. And I think that's the thing. If we really want to be honest and prioritizing young people in realizing the agenda, we have to make sure those who are possessing the resources actually share them and make sure that they are involved. Um, and if for example, you should not just go vote, you should run for office uh, if we actually want people to get involved. Because I think that's the problem. We keep talking about these is this issues. Uh, this isn't the first time that I'm invited to talk about how to involve young people, but we keep talking about the problem instead of actually doing it. There are a lot of people who are working for these things, but we are working not together. We are working side by side. We are working in youth organizations and other ways in adult organizations. And we have to make sure that we cooperate because that's the, that's the solution. We have to share the resources and power to actually influence and impact society equally. Thank you. Noura, when I'm looking at the European Union and the meetings, it doesn't really look like they are following Hanna's advice and collaborating and doing it in partnership and, and always moving forward together. You are sitting in a European Youth Parliament, uh, so how are you as young people managing to collaborate on setting the agenda? First of all, uh, a huge uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. And I also want to clarify that we're not uh, connected to the EU, uh, we're not connected to the parliament, but it's usually quite confusing when you have the word parliament and European in the same name that people think that 
Uh, but we still but work perhaps with you're even though managing it better. Yeah, <laughs> uh, just our regional scope is 40 countries, so we also work with non-EU countries. Uh, but I kind of want to frame the way we work with this uh, by talking about uh, the capacity building mechanisms in the framework of the agenda. So 7 .3, Article 7.3 of the framework talks about capacity building, and within capacity building, there are specifically three things that we think are important. The first one is mechanisms for national engagement, meaning you engage all of society, uh, and that's where we kind of come in. The second one is incorporating the SDGs and targets in national planning mechanisms and national strategies. And the third thing is uh, building capacity so that countries can measure and monitor, so the statistical frameworks. But if I go back to this first part of mechanisms for national engagement, I think we have seen a great example in, in the past year of how something personal has become political. I'm thinking specifically of the Me Too movement. When people realize that personal issues are political, that's when we see engagement, that's when we see change. And we also try to work the other way around. How do we make political issues personal? How do young people realize that cohesion policy directly affects them, that agriculture and food security issues impact them. So what we do in the European Youth Parliament is we hold 600 events every year, uh, bringing together 1,600 working groups of young people. We let them sit in a room with young people from other countries in Europe and come up with proposals on how to tackle these issues. And the proposals that they come with have their own perspectives. How are they affected by climate change? How are they affected by defense and security issues? So making politics personal and making personal issues seem political, because they are, that's where we come in. And we really think that that's when you create ownership. I usually get the question, so give me your five policy issues that you're working with. And it's difficult if you're working in 40 countries with almost 40,000 people to say, these are the five issues that 40,000 young people agree on. It's not easy to find out what young people think. We have 1,600 resolutions every year. If you actually want to find out what young people think, you have to make an effort to speak with many young people. Uh, so it's not just about being around the table, it's about active citizenship, it's about voting, it's about engaging in your everyday life, it's about how you relate to pol political issues, uh, and we cover all of these topics at our events, uh, and many more, uh, and we have seen uh, in in our existence since 1987, we've educated hundreds of thousands of young Europeans to actually feel a connection to the EU, a connection to Europe, a connection to their local communities, and that's a difficult task where we need many partners. So we're looking forward to working more on these issues. It sounds like we should send you to the European Parliament <laughs> and educate some of our politicians. Uh, Vladas, uh, Juden from Lithuanian Youth Council. And now we listen to the UN, Europe, different regional perspectives. And then it all comes down to you. Uh, the natural implementation and the role of the nation and the young people. So what's your take on this? Well, hello and thank you for inviting to this uh, great uh, event. Uh, everything that was said by my colleagues here, it's kind of true in Lithuania, the situation is the, very similar. What we have in, 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 in reality is that uh, young people, mostly, they don't know about these goals. They don't know. If you want, well, will go out in the street, they won't know 17, but they will know each and every one uh, because it's uh, in their morality and it's in the solidarity of our society. And what we are doing as the Lithuanian Youth Council, we are raising the understanding that these things, these goals, they should be collaborating and, and uh, um, all together because all our organizations, what we have, we have 70 youth major organizations in Lithuania, they are working on these goals, but they need to work it together to achieve it. What we have next uh, uh, is that uh, we are jealous that you have uh, youth uh, delegations uh, sitting along with the, with the uh, 
other council members and then suggesting uh, what, what, what could be done better. We don't have it. And then when uh, someone says that, well, you are young people, you are our future, well, I'm saying, hello, I'm here now. <laughs> and, and we are not the future, we are now, and, and, and we can say our voice now and, and our opinion now. Because what will happen next, in 10 or 15 years, when we will be in their place, we, wa we don't want to be freshers. We want to be uh, uh, at already uh, highly expert level to discuss the topics that are uh, issued by the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, the situation is that we are raising the awareness that there are some goals and we should work on these goals all together. And a few weeks ago from the Lithuanian Ministry of Environment we got the report uh, about what Lithuania is doing on these goals uh, for the UN uh, office in New York. And they asked us to check and add some comments. And what was so weirdly interesting that we understood that the report is made for the office, uh, for the UN office, but not for us, not for Lithuania to understand where we are at the exact time, because we are not at the best level and we are not scoring top 10. We need firstly to understand the Baltic three countries, we need first to understand that these goals are for us to check where we can do better. And youth are quite important at this stage to get to be involved and say what can be done better, where we can collaborate, and where we can uh, jointly agree on, on working on these goals. And what I liked from the uh, head of the of, uh, government of Holland, Holland's, uh, that uh, you, you said that your islands are in, in the middle of the Baltic Sea, and if you will be super extra environmentally friendly and all the countries all around will be not. So there will be uh, a chance for you to, to, to uh, stay at the same good level. So what I'm telling that we need to collaborate and, and, and work together on these issues in the, within the region. And, and we want to do it and we're already having some good projects with uh, Swedish uh, youth uh, Council, how young people can be involved in the Baltic Sea region strategy and say their voice. We have to do it all together. Uh, I'm happy that you invited us from the, across the Baltic Sea to, to be in this event and, and we want to be always together and uh, not only Lithuania but Latvia and Estonia can be part of the changers and change makers. Thank you. Thank you very much and time flies so... <laughs> So thank you very much for this panel. I think the key, my key conclusion uh, is actually that the importance of having young people represented, not only going listening out, but young represented uh, participating when the decision is taken and listening to different perspectives, whether they're Nordic, Lithuanian, Baltic, European, global or Swedish. So thank you very much. And then we welcome up Trine which is leading the Generation 2030 program for the Nordic Council of Ministers, which is about then to set off a couple of change agents. Good to be here. And uh, I just want to correct you right there. My good colleague, Anina, who couldn't be here today, is the program manager. I'm the project coordinator of uh, this uh, program. And from this very interesting panels of great ideas, is now going to get slightly uh, more concrete. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a concrete project uh, or a program that we have. And it's good to hear our sister organization, the Nordic Council, come with all the recommendations for what we should do on a Nordic level, because now I'm going to respond to these uh, here. Um, so as I said, I work at the Nordic Council of Ministers as a project coordinator for this program, which was adopted last year. Um, I have to go through this really quickly because we have many other great speakers afterwards. So if there's anything you'd like to have more detail on afterwards, please come up to me. I'm more than happy to talk more about it. Um, before jumping into the program itself, I just want to give very few words about uh, the organization I come from. So the Nordic Council of Ministers is the collaboration between the five Nordic governments, including uh, Greenland, Åland and the Faroe Islands. And uh, our sister organization, the Nordic Council, we share the same house in uh, Copenhagen, but we also have offices around the Nordic region and uh, good institutions and culture houses. Although it sounds like a council, we're actually 11 councils uh, working across 
many different policy areas from environment policy to digitalization to the economy to education and research to health and so on. Uh, sustainable development and the 2030 agenda is placed under the Council for the Cooperation Ministers uh, and it's actually also one of our three cross-cutting strategy meaning that in everything that these 11 councils do, we have to work cross-cutting with gender equality, with involving children and youth, and with sustainable development. Uh, the Nordic countries have been working with sustainable development jointly since uh, the late 19s, actually, uh, and the first strategy was adopted uh, early 2000s. So when the 2030 agenda came about in 2015, it was very natural that we thought about, okay, well, now that the Nordic countries have to implement these goals, how do we best support our member states in doing so? What are their challenges? What do they need? What kind of support? Uh, Krista from uh, CBSS already mentioned this briefly, but one of the things that we did uh, was take out this publication called Bumps on the Road to 2030. Uh, this is now about a year and a half old, uh, or a year old, uh, and although you can discuss at length the indicators that you use and should this be yellow or should this be green, it still gives you a rough indicator of where our challenges are. Um, of course, this is not surprising to us. We've been talking about this already, that we have a, a huge challenge when it comes to sustainable consumption and production, which is number 12 here. Um, and also, I want to say about that goal is that it's very cross-cutting. If you work about how we consume, that's going to have a major impact on the environment, on our work conditions, on gender equality, and so on. So therefore, we decided that when we started this Generation 2030 program, this should be the main focus of uh, the program. It should be how do we in the Nordic countries work with one of our biggest challenges and that is uh, sustainable consumption and production. So instead of just looking at what we're doing good or uh, what um, we could maybe improve slightly, we actually take the biggest challenge and that's what we decided to work on jointly Nordic. Uh, the program is uh, running three years, so that's till 2020. Um, the main objectives of it is, I put them up here, you can have the slides. Uh, one big thing is to mainstream the 2030 agenda throughout Nordic co collaboration, so in everything that we do across all of these 11 councils. But since you're looking at your clock, I'm going to skip right on to the youth involvement key. Um, because as the name says, Generation 2030, this is really about involving youth. And uh, one of the big things that we've done for that is that we've nominated uh, two youth experts to sit in the steering group of the program. And actually one of them is here today, which is Nora. I know she'll be on stage uh, later. So they will sit and actually guide the program activities, guide how we, what we decide to fund, guide uh, the work that we do. Uh, and I think that's a really excellent way of concretely involving youth. Then we're supporting the Regeneration uh, Summit in Åland, uh, we're very excited about that. We've given funding for uh, three uh, summits in 18, 19 and 20, and we're very keen to see what comes out of that. And then finally, uh, we have a, an, a grant program that we've given extra support um, to focus on the 2030 agenda. We have a number of other activities which uh, you can all come up and hear more about if you are curious, but what I want to say in general about these is that in everything that we do in all of the activities, we ask, our, we ask ourselves how do we include a youth perspective, we ask our uh, youth representatives how to best work with that. Um, so finally, my last comment is where, where do we stand when this program ends in 2020 and hopefully we'll have a new program continuing. We hope that we will have mainstreamed the 2030 agenda throughout Nordic collaboration in the projects, in our budget, in everything that we do. We hope that we will have uh, contributed to a stronger effort on a Nordic level on sustainable consumption and production. We hope that we will have done so in dialogue, in debates, uh, being out in all of the Nordic regions, uh, even the smallest places. And uh, finally, we hope that we've done all of our activities with an active uh, youth perspective. So that was the fastest I could do it. Uh, Thank you very much. You were splendid. <laughs> and and you used the opportunity to talk with Trine during our talk session uh, when we're finished. Now it's my great privilege to invite Per Bolund, our Minister for Financial Markets, Consumer Affairs and also development in some sense because when we're looking at Sweden and how we consume, we're more a developing country than a developed country. So the floor is yours. Very much welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for inviting me and uh, also thank you for a very, very interesting seminar. And uh, I really appreciate the work that is being conducted now in uh, trying to get involvement and get the enthusiasm and the knowledge uh, from the coming generations. I think that that is actually crucial in order to reach the uh, goals that we have set up and also to come over the obstacles that we are facing uh, in, in the world today. Um, I think that focusing on uh, the generation uh, that is coming and also on the generation that is living on this planet together at this time is, of course, uh, very, very important. Um, I think that Ban Ki-moon, uh, the UN uh, General Secretary, uh, focused very well on this when he said that we are the first generation that can end poverty on the planet, but we are also the last generation that can put an end to global climate change. And that puts perspective on the challenges that we are facing, but also the opportunities that we have. We have so many opportunities to make the coming world a better place for all of us together. Um, when I was uh, the coming generation, when I was uh, young, growing up, uh, I spent a lot of time in the archipelago here outside of Stockholm, uh, living very close to the Baltic Sea and, of course, uh, becoming very fond of, of the ocean and uh, what it actually provides for us as citizens. Uh, and then over time, as I saw the t deterioration of the Baltic Sea uh, with my own eyes, when I could see that the fish that I was fishing and eating when I was a kid wasn't suitable as food uh, when I was an adult, and when I saw the eutrophication of the ocean that made it uh, not so nice to swim in as, as it was when I was a young kid, uh, I saw that this is something that is actually a problem that we all have to take action in order to prevent and to steer our planet in the right direction. And that is something that really pushed me to uh, uh, try to, to make a change and uh, also steered me into, uh, for example, uh, studying biology and focusing on marine biology in my education. And then also afterwards taking the step over to politics uh, because I started realizing that if we are to actually manage the planet in a better way, we have to have more involvement. We have to start putting these questions on the top of the agenda. So that was my way into politics and into uh, eventually the Swedish government uh, as well. Um, and of course, we are now trying to um, take the decisions that are necessary in order to actually uh, leave a better planet for the coming generation than the one uh, we inherited. Uh, and I think that we have come some way along the quite difficult path, uh, but uh, we are moving in the right direction. And I think that what we, we're seeing behind me here today, the uh, Global Sustainable Development Goals, is a very, very fine example of that. Uh, here, the uh, nations of the world have actually agreed on a map for the future, a pathway to a sustainable world, 17 goals that together, if we achieve them, can actually make sure that we both can fix the social problems, social issues, but also the environmental issues for the future. So I think that we have the framework that we need, and now of course the next step is implementation, uh, trying to make sure that these goals are also met. And I'm very happy that the Nordic Council of Ministers and the Nordic countries have decided that yes, we should lead the way forward. From the Swedish government we've stated very clearly that we should be the first country to implement these goals uh, to make sure that they are also met. We think that we have perhaps the best opportunities, so of course we also have a great uh, well challenge and we also have to, to of course, uh, walk the walk. Um, we have, of course, uh, very many tools to use. The technology is now helping us very much. We have the tools that we need in order to make a sustainable world happen. We have the energy technologies, we have the transportation technologies. Now we have to make sure that they are implemented as fast as possible and that they are, there are economic incentives for us all to start using them uh, in a new way. I'm also very happy that uh, Generation 2030 has focused on consumption issues and uh, on Goal 12, on sustainable consumption and production. And I think that that is very wise. I think that that is perhaps the most challenging goal for us in the Nordic countries to actually reach. Uh, we know that uh, the consumption that we are uh, involved in at the moment is far from sustainable. No matter how you measure it, uh, whether you measure it as climate effect from the consumption that we have on a planetary basis, or if you measure it as the ecological footprint, uh, we know that we are not sustainable. Um, for example, if you look at the uh, environmental footprint, we consume as if we had four planets uh, on this on, on the world, and we know for sure that that is not the case. So uh, we have to change these patterns, of course. And that is the reason why we have also focused from the government side on 
consumption issues and how to make our consumption sustainable for the future. So we started by launching a strategy for sustainable consumption, uh, looking at how can we actually do this together, what is needed from policymakers, from politics, in order to make it possible for us as consumers to be part of the solution to the challenges we're facing. We know for a fact that Swedish consumers, and I believe that is true for the Nordic level as well, are very, very committed. We want, to, as consumers, to be part of the solution. We want to uh, help the planet heal. Uh, but we also say that we find it challenging. We need more tools, we need better information, we need services in order to actually be able to um, take a stand as a consumer. So that is what we're focus focusing on. How can we make it easier for consumers in Sweden to actually be part of the change that we need? Uh, we've taken uh, some very interesting steps forward. Uh, for example, we've uh, lowered the VAT, the tax on repairs, from 25 to 12 percent, making it affordable and even economically logical to repair and mend our goods rather than just throwing it away and buying the next goods instead. Uh, we've uh, come up with a deduction on services in your home, so when you repair your white goods in your home, you actually can deduct 50% of the labor cost. So these are ways to actually change the economic logic from just buying and throwing into repairing and reusing and making sure that it's, it's actually affordable and possible to be uh, an intelligent and uh, sustainable consumer. We've also started seeing how can we work together, finding arenas and, and frameworks for working together, all participants in society. So we're launching a forum for sustainable consumption that will be led by the Authority on Consumer Affairs. And we're also, Nura will help us, uh, giving us advice on how we can work with these issues and also getting the voice of the younger generation into this work. But of course we have to do much more than that as well. And uh, what gives me great hope in this perspective is that we see so much much change from the consumers uh, in Sweden and in the Nordic countries. S consumers are actually starting to change and uh, the first signal of that is that we're changing what we consume. Uh, we are buying much more of organic food, we are buying much more of fair trade marked products. Uh, so people are starting to not just saying that they want change but also acting for change. So what we're consuming is, is starting to change. But we also see a movement when it comes to how we're consuming. And I think that Hannah pointed that out very well. Uh, there is an opportunity to get our services, the services we need, without being massive consumers in the modern society. Uh, we see that the sharing economy is growing at a, an incredible rate. And that, of course, gives us the opportunity to use the items that we have in society in a much more smart and much more efficient way. And that is something that we want to improve the chances for from the Swedish government. So we're looking into now how can we make the taxation system uh, supporting this movement, how can we uh, make it economically rational to participate in the sharing economy. Uh, there is obvious uh, examples that th this is doable. When you look at an average car, for example, it's actually parked, standing idle for 97% of the time. Uh, and it's only used very sparsely to, to go to and from work, for example. And that, of course, gives an opportunity to use that car in a more, much more sustainable manner, using it together, carpooling and using, for example, sharing and lending uh, opportunities. Um, when you look at the clothing that we all are uh, wearing, uh, there are opportunities there as well. Uh, when we ask Swedish consumers, about 75% say that they only use half of their uh, wardrobe every year. So half of the items we have in our wardrobe is never used over an average year. And that is, of course, not very uh, clever consumption. Uh, so there is an opportunity to, for example, have a subscription services where you subscribe to clothing so you get access to a wardrobe that many others can use as well. Uh, or uh, for that case, uh, renting your clothes, uh, as we heard, is an opportunity that is growing. Buying second hand, which I've been doing with this suit, for example, and it's uh, working quite well for me. So I think that there are many opportunities here to also look at how we consume for the future. Uh, one item and, or, or a, a, a policy segment that we're looking into that we are very interested in is uh, what is called nudging. How can we use behavior science to make it easier for consumers to make the smart choices? And here we also see incredible opportunities uh, making it easier for us to do the environmentally sustainable choice. Uh, some examples that we've seen uh, when, for example, in, in uh, cantinas, when you have smaller plate sizes, uh, you just shrink the size, size of the plate. Actually, we see that people take less food and there is 
30% less waste of food in such containers. It doesn't harm my opportunity to get the food I want, uh, but it actually changes my behavior in a more sustainable manner. Uh, when you look at, uh, for example, Copenhagen had an interesting experiment where they set up footprints in the street leading up to the waste baskets. And only these, this little very, very easy signal to us as consumers where to put our waste decreased the waste in the streets with 50%. So using these signaling instruments, using uh, nudging as a way to make it easy for us to make smart choices can have a tremendous impact and make it easy to be a sustainable consumer. So that is also something that we're looking into quite intensely. So, um, we are changing what we're buying, we're changing how we are consuming. I think that the next step we have to start discussing, and that is my main message to you today, is also start discussing why we are consuming. Because it's obvious that we're not consuming only to uh, get what we need for life. We are also consuming for signaling purposes. We are consuming as therapy. When I feel bad, I go out consuming something and it makes me feel better. Well, uh, perhaps that is a positive thing, but it's not positive from an environmental standpoint. Uh, we are also using consumption as a social uh, means to get social connections. And uh, I think that we ha perhaps we have to think more about uh, the reasons for consumption in our society today and see how we can fulfill the needs that we have in other ways rather than through mass consumption. And I think that that is something that uh, the coming generation obviously is thinking about and which gives me great hope for the future. Uh, we have a, a car commercial uh, running today saying that uh, we shouldn't let the things we consume consume us. We shouldn't let the things we own own us. Uh, and that is also something that I see that the coming generation is uh, thinking a lot about. Uh, perhaps it's not through the bag we use or the shoes we buy that defines us. It's actually what we do as citizens and the thoughts we have that is important for the future. And that, that is something that I think we have to have much more of a discussion on in society and that we want to uh, take part in such a discussion for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. For that, for that further discussion, we're actually going to invite up uh, Elin Larsson, your uh, sustainability director at Philippa Co. Perhaps I can see that you're Perhaps it could be from there. Uh, and Nora Löfström, uh, Special Finnish Youth Corporation Alisi. And Linnea Lundmark, Network Coordinator of the SDSN Youth. Uh, pa, you started off really by talking about your political engagement and how you entered politics. And, and let's see here if we can make sustainable consumption the new wave of political engagement. So I'm starting off with you, Elin. What is it that you as a producer is seeing when it comes to the choices that people is making and what do you see yourself as a driving force regarding that or what are you responding to? And how much does the examples that Per mentioned when it comes to political initiatives, how much do that matter and how much is driven by you? Um, I think, first of all, we can never put the responsibility on the users or the consumers. That I just want to make clear. So the responsibility comes back to us. What is it that we offer our customers? Um, do we have sustainable offerings so that they can actually act in a different way? But to be able to do that, to be able to change that, we also need support from politi politics, from policy makers. And I think uh, we know the, the, what Par, the work PAR actually has been driving and we're really happy for that. But we need to see a lot more. Um, to uh, support new business models, for instance, to really uh, make sure that second-hand business, for instance, can, can grow even more, or the subscription and the rental uh, ideas that you've been talking about. So I think that's really important. Pan, when you're listening to this and when you're going into this shore and, you're, and, and you mentioned that, you know, how you're changing your wardrobe depending on that, where do you feel most powerful as a consumer or as a minister of the government trying to, you know, change consumer behavior? <laughs> well, I think that, of course, I'm in a position where I have the possibility to, to improve the possibilities to, for, for so many people to act. And, of course, I think that that is a, a, well, a responsibility that uh, I have and uh, that I'm very grateful that I have this opportunity. But I don't think that uh, there is any one sector in society that can solve these issues. We have to do it. Uh, in, we have to change all uh, sectors of our society. And I think that we have a personal responsibility, of course. And I'm trying to live as, as a sustainable life as possible uh, in my everyday life, um, biking to work rather than taking a car or something. And 
also in the way I consume and the, way, in the clothing I wear. Uh, and of course, I think that that is also a way to uh, um, make sure that you are the change you want to see in the world, as uh, I think it was uh, Gandhi that said it. And uh, I think that is important also f to, to uh, make sure that you have, uh, uh, well, that you are content with your life. You want to be part of a positive development. But we also see that it's not very easy to live a sustainable life in the society we have today. So that is the reason why we need so much more policy, so much, much more change in the economic system in order to make it rational for companies to provide these services and for consumers to use them. Uh, so we have to do both. Yeah, I just, I just came to think about also that, we, at least from a company perspective, I think, I don't know about you, but we tend to try to find solutions to solve the problem rather than actually mm -hmm. satisfying a need. And in order to create the change that we really need to see, we need to understand the need. And this is also where the youth comes in. Mm -hmm. To really listen to them, understand, engage with them, to understand what is the actual need and how can we find a sustainable solution to that. I think that's really important. So let's bring in Nora and Linnea. You are the young generation and you're specialized on this and, and I'm not going to ask you what would be different if you were Elin and Per. Uh, one day you will be and, and perhaps they don't want to hear the answer of it, but, but, uh, but Nora, please. Uh. Well, I think Elin and Per are really like uh, speaking with the values that we also want to see in the future and like uh, putting all the responsibility on the consumer is not what we want to see like of course consumer choices what kind of light bulbs you have uh, if you recycle your plastic if you bike to work if you buy ecological products if you're vegan or whatever of course that has a, a meaning and and that makes a change but you really have to have it on the policy la level and look at like the holistic and big picture to to make the change so if you have your own plastic bag when you go to the store and don't buy a single use plastic bag of course that's a great thing but then you also need to look like how do you go away from that store do you bike or do you use your own private car or do you uh, then walk or or yeah so that has like actually a really big impact but I think you both are on the very uh, good uh, good path and also young people today very seldom have uh, driver's licenses so how many people here don't have a driver's license Yes, so quite many. How many are vegetarian or vegan? And how many are doing this for climate reasons or sustainability? Yet yeah, quite many. So that's also like a, a new wave. And of course there are the young people who, because you can't look at young people as like a big group that everyone's like exactly the same. They're the ones who consume fast fashion, uh, go to H&M instead of Philippe Co. <laughs> and then they're the ones who, who then actually like rent their clothes, who buy ecological recycle, use secondhand and so on. So there's a big gap and also to make sure that we're aware of the choices we make. We know that we can uh, that it actually has an impact. So giving the knowledge and the power to the consumer, to the young people, and to the rest of society is really vital. And there, both of you are doing a very good job. So you are admitted. <laughs> you are, okay. Uh, Lilia, please, uh, what is the role of your network coordinator of the SNS in youth? Yep. What are you trying to do, and what is the importance of connecting youth globally in order to stress this agenda forward? Uh, well, our vision is uh, simple but ambitious to empower youth to create sustainable solutions because we believe that young people possess the uh, unquestionable uh, important uh, characteristics. They are idealistic, we are the most educated uh, generation in history, we do have the knowledge, we are brought up and, and raised in a very uh, challenging uh, in a world with a lot of challenges. So we have another understanding of the, of the holistic perspectives of sustainability and global development issues. Uh, so we're really trying to, to, to do this by educating, connecting and supporting young people uh, and we are you know we have the knowledge we have the tools and especially in the Nordic countries we have the uh, amazing conditions to do this we just need to act now we need and we we believe that prepping and and preparing the the young people with the tools to think and to act sustainably is key basically so yeah but Linnea and Nora, so we are, you're talking about need of action and you're talking really how young people is driving this change. What would you say are the main obstacles for achieving this? 
Go ahead. Oh, yes, I, I have the answer. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, because I think everyone agrees that we have a problem and we need to act today instead of acting tomorrow, and it's really urgent, and everyone sees that global warming is an issue, and there's like, uh, we overuse the resources, but then the means, like how to get to the solution, people disagree on that. States don't have the same, uh, same ideas. So having these 17 sustainable development goals, that's already like a huge step that there is something that we agree upon and we can say that it's like the rights of the future generations that we do our best to actually achieve these goals. Uh, but also when we talk about youth empowerment and youth inclusion in all of this, so there are different levels of how to uh, involve young people. And for instance, that uh, Nora is in, in this uh, group that's like a very good, uh, that's very high on, this, on the ladder of participation. So like the non-participation of young people is basically manipulation, decoration, and tokenism of actually just putting young people on the podium and taking some photos and saying, okay, like we're involving young people, because that's not involving young people. So then what you have to do, there are then the levels of actual participation, starting from that young people are assigned but informed, then consulted and informed, then that adult initiated and directed, and then the next one is that child or young person initiated and directed, and then the highest level of participation of young people is that when uh, young people are initiated and they can share the decisions with adults and actually have the power and so on. So this whole regeneration uh, summit, for instance, because that is from young people to young people, and also then involving decision makers as well, because we need to have a, like a higher level policy impact as well, and not just like young people talking amongst young people, but also to share uh, with uh, policy makers and so on. So that's already a great thing to yeah. go forward. And, and uh, connecting back to, to the educational part that, that we focus on in SDS and Youth, um, the Regeneration 2030 Summit is a brilliant example of how to flip uh, the tables and educate established leaders from a youth perspective. Um, so we really think that it doesn't, it's not necessarily educating young people only, but also educating established leaders and talking about uh, finding out what the need is uh, among a big group of of society, um, we uh, yeah, it's a it's a really important purpose. Thank you. We, we're going to invite uh, Rosaline again, and also Simon Holmström, which is chairman of the Regeneration. So we are about to close now. And 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 as we are doing that, and they are stepping up here, Per is Trump actually the one that is saving us? Because I've talked on a lot of you know sustainability panels uh, during a lot of years, and 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 earlier on today there was a lot of address regarding you know go and vote, political participation, and you started off with you know, how you got engaged in politics. So, so are we actually seeing a kind of mobilization on the political side, or what is it that you meet when you are Sweden on the global area, uh, which are the main obstacles? Absolutely, I see a, a growing commitment and a, a need or, or a wanting to, to take part in, in society and, and taking a, a share in, in also directing society in the right direction. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm positive there, uh, although we also see some quite negative um, developments with a more populist movement growing and gaining power in many parts of the world. So m my hope is that if we can actually start delivering uh, from politics on these goals, providing evidence that we are actually taking the challenges seriously, uh, we are uh, finding solutions. My hope is that that will gain even more commitment and people will start seeing that, yes, there is uh, a reason to involve in politics and to involve in our societies and together we can make a change. However, if we do not show that, if we do not show that we are meeting the challenges that people are very much concerned about, I think that then we have a risk moving in the wrong direction and people will instead start seeking advice from, from populist leaders, providing very easy answers, uh, and that would be a very, very negative impact. So I think that the responsibility is, is ours. Uh, we have to make sure that we show that uh, we have the way forward and we are starting to follow it. Thank you. Then I'm turning to... Rosaline and Simon, because you are actually here to evaluate us. So, so the question is, have we today uh, done what Per said that we need to do in, in taking responsibility and, and taking action, or have we not been successful today? Or, or what is, Simon, 
uh, your key conclusions from what you have listened to during this one and a half hour, which is actually over, and that's why we're going to try to do this in three minutes. <laughs> it's too short indeed. It's too short. Yes, it is. Thank you for the question. Um, as uh, the, the, the chair of the um, steering group of the regeneration, which is a new movement, we've seen this before, this discussion, and it's been going for quite some while. And uh, to be honest, I'm quite frustrated on it. Uh, I wanted to, you know, uh, to come a little bit forward. We've got a, a, a splendid um, uh, Agenda 2030. Uh, we got a, a lot of engagement from the youth. We got a, a lot of discussions, but this discussions between adults and youth uh, often centre around transferring, uh, you know, the present to the youth with the, the structures that are you know, established already, we have to make something else. We have to, as Nora said, take steps uh, on the participation ladder so that we can take steps uh, in this endeavor to, to, to um, you know, reach a sustainable world, really. That's the main issue with, with the regeneration. Thank you. Rosalina, have we lived upon and acted upon your introductory remarks? Mm -hmm. Thank you. In order to get a sustainable planet and sustainable lives, we have to give power and patterns, give away power and patterns. And what I mean with that, if we want to implement the Agenda 2030 the, uh, agenda, uh, we have to, uh, or at least the decision maker has to give power to young people, because young people are the catalyst of sustainable development goals. And when it comes to patterns, as many have mentioned before, we have to give away patterns because we, in a global aspect, we, we, have, we have a luxury in consumption in Sweden. We have a luxury in consumption. And this is why in my keynote speech I said we have to be brave and ambitious. Are we ready to give up power and pattern? Are decision makers ready to give power to young people? The catalyst of this uh, reform or revolution, peaceful revolution, are we ready to give up patterns? Are we ready to, uh, to, uh, to change our, our, our lives uh, for, for the next coming generations? Are we ready? So that's my question, actually. This is, we'll, I will send it to you uh, to continue that discussion. Are we ready to do that? Because we are the ones that affect us. We are the ones answering that, okay? But let's, I have two questions. How many of you who are sitting in and listening to this discussion today are going to change your, consume your behavior afterwards? Hands up. <laughs> who dares not to? <laughs> And then the final question goes to Per, and, and, and you are allowed to answer, not as a minister, but as the young person entering politics, if that is easier. When should Sweden fulfill the 2030 agenda? Well, of course, uh, as I said, I think that we have perhaps the greatest opportunities in the world among all nations to, to reach these uh, goals. And then, of course, we have also the responsibility to move rapidly forward. We don't have the date, uh, but we've said that we should be the first welfare country in the world to be uh, fossil free. And that is, of course, uh, a great challenge uh, that makes change necessary and immediate change. So we are moving as rapidly as we can. And, uh, of course, we will uh, reach the goals before uh, the time is up in 2030. I think that is a good conclusion. All of you are invited to stay around and take use of all of these young experts with a lot of knowledge and a lot of visions, which are the future politicians, I would say. So stay tuned, start mingling, and also save the date for the 18th to 20th of August when we're all going to Åland in order to study how can a local community be globally leading. Thanks for all of you for coming. Thanks a lot to the panelists.